Go, cool, start again. Um, you join us for a conversation in which we hope to discuss what good support looks like um, to a growing community of archivists needing to expand their dig digital preservation expertise. And we hope to compare approaches and methods of knowledge sharing between vendors, educators, and communities. Um, I feel very privileged to be sat amongst this talented group of people. Um, my name is Joanna White. I've um, been working six years um, until last week for the Media Archive of Central England as a digital technician. Um, it's a small independent charity archive with eight full, full and part-time employees um, in a reasonably large collection comprising mostly regional television news archives from the 50s to the 80s. My role included post-production and um, grading film scans and as a sort of sideline preservation kind of activities um, for SD video and film workflows. Prior to this, I was self-employed as a video producer, so I have no experience in archiving at all. Um, and entering an archival institution presented me with a lot of very sudden, um, steep learning curves. Um, so since No Time to Wait 3 last year, I've been very busy throwing myself into open source solutions and creating workflows within the archive at MACE um, in a way that costs us very little cash but brings us up to some good standards. Um, so I would say I'm a fangirl of knowledge sharing within the open source community, really, to wind up mine. Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Bryce Rowe. Um, I'm here from Andover, Massachusetts, where I work as the director of audio preservation at a conservation center um, called NEDCC. So we're a nonprofit conservation and preservation center. Um, so. Uh, within my institution, um, we do book and paper conservation, digital imaging, as well as audio preservation, which is the department that um, I direct. Um, and we also do a lot of outreach, continuing education, um, consultations, collection assessments, things like that through a preservation services department um, that is meant to uh, provide accessible information for preservation. Um, and then some of those more complicated projects that can't be done in-house um, come to us. Um, so uh, I'm trained as an archivist and pre previously worked as an archivist, and now I'm in a service provider role where um, I'm largely consulting with, with archivists at small to mid-sized institutions. Um, uh, in large part, um, understanding of audiovisual formats was not part of their training as archivists often. Um, and so uh, leading up to, to the work that we do, um, a lot of my work involves helping our clients identify their formats even, or prepare an inventory, or prioritize. And um, uh, so it's, it's also highly educational, as it needs to be. Um, and I'm excited to talk about that today. <laughs> I'm Ashley, you just met me, or maybe you already knew me. Uh, so I already explained a bit of what I do. I don't want to repeat it too much. Um, I, well, when I, I'm, I've been working um, this semester uh, as an adjunct professor at the Pratt Institute, so I am teaching uh, graduate level libraries, archives, and museums, as well as data visualization and UX students on um, information technologies, sort of a foundational class that covers a wide variety of topics. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I work at Artifactual Systems. Uh, my title is AV Preservation Specialist. So I work fundamentally as a systems archivist on Archivematica, uh, which is a microservice based uh, open source workflow management change for digital preservation, getting things prepared for long-term digital preservation storage. Uh, and in that role, I think I, a lot of what I do is I interact with a lot of uh, archivists at different institutions of all different sizes, uh, and I work primarily um, sort of interfacing with them, helping them use the software, supporting the use of their software, and of course fixing any technical issues that arise, or finding someone who can. Um, so yeah, that's me, I think. My turn. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ben Turkus. Um, I'm a late joiner to this panel, uh, but thank you for including me. I think it's a great topic. Um, and while I was hesitant to join, 
uh, general nerves getting up in front of the crowd. I remembered last year when we had a panel on open source sponsorship, the open source hustle. At the last minute, I begged Kieran O'Leary to join us, and he graciously did. Um, so I felt like in the spirit of no time to wait, pay it forward, that I should answer the call. Um, in terms of some biographical stuff, I currently work at New York Public Library, where I manage our in-house audio and video digitization team of six to seven people. Um, and I also teach at night, one semester, uh, the fall semester, a video preservation class at New York University's Moving Image Archiving and Preservation Program, where I also graduated from. So I think I can speak uh, to both sides of being a student, uh, but also being an educator. And before working at New York Public Library, I worked at the Bay Area Video Coalition, where I managed our preservation projects. Hello to everyone from BayVac, I love you. Um, and BayVac, for those who don't know it, is very similar to any DCC in that it's a smaller, not-for-profit uh, video digitization vendor. So I can also hopefully speak to the vendor side of this as well. Thank you very much, Ben. We really appreciate you joining us today. Um, so we'll get started with the first question. Um, what complications have you encountered when attempting to train archivists with variable skill levels and differing fields of knowledge? And as specific areas of knowledge threaten to become obsolete as technicians retire, how do you encourage knowledge transfer, particularly when job security or vendor income is aligned to this expertise? Who'd like to go first? We can break that question down. Uh, I can jump you on. Can go yeah. Um, I mean, this is a big, a big question, um, and I think there are a number of pieces to it, but um, one thing that I really felt uh, kind of hit in the face with when I started working at BayVac um, was my lack of knowledge when it came to VCR repair and maintenance. And while the programs that are out there, the one that I graduated from, provide as much training as I think they can in some of these things, it's really not engineering school, and that's not the kind of expertise that they're really supposed to be providing. It is very much a disappearing uh, knowledge base. Uh, I'm excited to hear uh, Brianna talk about this tomorrow. Um, I worked really hard to try to create grant programs in which retiring video engineers could train archivists in some of these skills, but uh, I was unsuccessful and I feel a little bit now like maybe it was a fool's errand on some level. I think. Certainly we want to encourage people to hack and learn some of these skills on their own, uh, but also there is possibly a limit to some of uh, what may be possible. Um, I'm not sure if that's something that people will disagree with. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> so at, an, at NEDCC, I, um, uh, I, I manage a small team of audio engineers and archivists or um, uh, students who are training to become more audio preservation specialists. Um, but I do think that there's a lot of value in having a team um, of both archivists and engineers um, and uh, just va valuing each individual's skill set that, that they bring. Um, and so I'm not trained as, a, as an audio engineer. I rely very much on my audio engineers to, to do troubleshooting. Um, but they also, being trained as audio, audio engineers, were, were entering a, a preservation field um, that brought a lot of new um, kind of thinking to the work that they do, where um, for audio engineers, they tend to kind of ho like hold their, hold their methods like very close at hand, and there's not a lot of knowledge sharing. Um, and bringing them into a preservation community where, where it was like, you need to document everything that you do ever and, and share it um, was, was kind of hard to hire for. So I think one of the challenges is, is collaborating with those kinds of experts that have, that have some, that are filling a gap in your own, in your own knowledge, but um, kind of in, in, indoctrinating them, for lack of a better word, into a preservation mindset. Um, but we still definitely rely very much on um, experts outside of our institution if our machines break um, and it just becomes about developing those relationships like I, I think you, you kind of can't can't le learn everything you you need to collaborate with others. I don't know if that answer the question. 
I'd say, uh, speaking in the context of an instructor, um, I, I'm usually, I'm around people who are learning either uh, for a full day workshop, a half day workshop, or in the case of, uh, at a graduate program, uh, three hours every week. And there's only so much you can do um, in terms of being able to convey that knowledge. I think, I think the students themselves are incredibly eager to learn, like they really want hands-on experience and training, um, but then they go back to their institutions and they don't have that space and capacity to grow and play and learn. And I think that that's, it's something that for me, it's difficult because I, I don't have any control over that. So I think it's up to the institution to be able to um, support emerging archivists with that work, either it's an internship or if it's their first job, or maybe they've been working for several years and are just switching into this kind of work. You know? um, and I don't know, that's, that's what I thought of. Uh, I'd, I'd agree with that completely. Um, having had six years um, just sort of thrown into an archivist role, I really would have loved it if somebody had sat me down in that first year and given me an overview of archival standards, uh, metadata, fixity, you know, um, formats, codex, and just an introduction to the terminology as well. Terms like normalize, I, I would never have really, it took me till year five to really understand what that meant in truth. Um, but I didn't always know what the type of training was that I needed because I, I wasn't aware of my um, lack of knowledge, I suppose, until I hit an error or an omission in my workflows, which was either introduced to me through some kind person saying, what's going on there? Um, or it tripped me up physically, you know, like your, like your FFmpeg logs, that kind of thing. I think um, it's especially, I think, challenging because archivists in particular have had so many different things thrown at them. There really is not the capacity for doing a lot of deep learning on different materials because you have to cover such a wide range of uh, tasks and tools and there's so much to know and you can come to a conference like this and think, oh, I want to investigate all of that stuff, but it's just hard to find the time to really to do that work and to specialize into something. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, um I find there's real value in struggling and fumbling through some of the challenges, whether it's whether they're analog or digital. So whether it was starting to work at Bayvac and not really feeling totally equipped to transfer all of the video formats that we were responsible for, and dealing with signal path issues and weird uh, deck problems and things of that nature, or whether it's working with FFmpeg and trying to uh, figure out what it's telling me and learn from the problems that are mostly human error. Um, and so I think um, more important than anything is the desire to want to learn and uh, the desire to uh, never stop striving for better, you know, and maybe not also insisting on best, as Dave said. Um, I think in the meantime, it's important. I think things that are more technical or engineering focused, there's this uh, this, this uh, preconceived notion that's incorrect that everything is done instantly and that it's not like a struggle and it doesn't take time to learn. Uh, and so I think and I, that's also, I think anyone coming into something new for the first time, maybe they're well trained in archives and standards and other things, and then they get to some, so they know a lot about that, and then they get to something that's more maybe technical or deck cleaning or something like that, and then they don't figure it out right away. And that's just the truth of, of learning. And I think as adults, we forget that, that that's what it takes, that it takes time to be able to understand things, get a lot of things wrong over and over and over, and keep going at it. Um, yeah, I think I, my, like, ideally as a manager of people, I like to just hire smart people and then not get in their way so that they can continue to learn and grow and do what they, what I hired them to do. Um, and I think where that gets really hard as a service provider, but I can imagine that this happens in our own institutions also, is just the, the pressure to be really productive. Um, certainly as a vendor, that's how we earn our income, that's how my staff is gonna get the raise they deserve. Um, and so you wanna say, you know, take, take time today to research this thing that you, you discovered, this challenge that you encountered, um, uh, and, and kind of balance that with like, you know, we have a project deadline and, and the work has to get done. Um, so I find that to be a challenge, but as, I think as much as, as much as you can just hire people who have the right mindset and, and then cultivate an environment where, where as much as you can, you can kind of not stand in their way to excel. That's 
pretty rewarding. I think that's very important, yeah. I feel really lucky to be at a place that there's just a lot of trust across, I mean, we're a small organization, 29 people, and there's a lot of trust across, um, across all of the people working there, and they just let you go and do it. Like, they trust you to do the work, yeah. yeah. Okay, that's um, our, our gatekeepers of knowledge preventing archival practitioners gaining access to information uh, that would inform better practices such as archive and IT support disconnects, um, management with blind acceptance of vendor technical support, um, or archival managers reluctant to share toolkits developed in-house at great personal costs to their own institutions. Is that something you've come across? I feel like I thought about this earlier when I was presented with this question, but I forgot immediately what I was going to say. Uh, I, I would say yes. It's a problem. <laughs> I would say yes, it's definitely a problem, but uh, seeing things like No Time to Wait um, grow and evolve and spread, this the idea of the No Time to Wait effect, and the people in this room who have done so much to encourage others to break down some of those barriers or resist them entirely and say, we're gonna go our own direction and we're gonna work together and learn from one another and support each other um, has been so inspiring to me. And I've seen such a transformation in this field in just the short time that I've been in, in it since like 2012. You know, when we were in school studying video preservation, there were none of the tools that are available to us now. And it's there's just so much more that can be done and it doesn't require um, the kinds of knowledge and expertise that were always deemed to be like essentials, right? And there's this sense that we can do it on our own and I, I'm seeing it and you know, we're living it, I guess. Yeah, I appreciate um, the Dave Rice's talk earlier and Dave's entire uh, ethos and way of being, <laughs> um, of making tools for archivists, uh, making tools by archivists and, and doing that work. I think um, with the gatekeeping thing, I think there's there's a lot of ego in um, the space. Oftentimes, it's not necessarily an ego of a person, but an ego of an institution that will sort of block things from happening. So like, and uh, there's also a lot of I think fear, also coming from the institution. Unless the individuals at times, the institution doesn't want to be wrong. They don't want to present as wrong. They want everyone to think that that they're the best. So it's a mix of of that kind of thing that I think keeps things locked down at times and not being able to share as much as, as, as an individual would want to do. And not even deliberately. I mean, sometimes I think accidentally institutions um, can sort of enforce gatekeeping on their own preservation practices. Myself only having been 2.5 days a week um, was a real problem for me to be able to develop preservation practices. Um, but it's nobody's fault. They're a charity. They don't have the cash flow. So there's, um, yeah, that was certainly an, an issue for me. And um, slowed down a good deal of progress. And it's not just about, um, you see, I don't think it works being a part-time preservation technician when um, the role is a solo role or it's not clearly defined. So I was called a digital technician, which had so much scope. Um, I really was overwhelmed by the amount of things that I could possibly be influencing in the, in the workspace. Um, and also, if there's insufficient training or support provided as well, that's real problems. And I think that's an area your company really works well with, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's so surprising to me that we would like be worried about other people learning how to do our jobs because there's no shortage of work to be done. Um, um, though I, un I understand that um, in terms of job security and things like that, um, it doesn't, doesn't mean just because there's no shortage of work to be done that there aren't a shortage of positions available to do that work. Um, but specifically from a, from a service provider perspective, I think I understood that to be the, the uh, sort of the business model um, to keep your clients in the dark so that they continue to rely on you. Um, and it's very much not what we do at NEDCC um, for a couple reasons. One being that it actually doesn't support our business model. Um, <laughs> uh, the work doesn't get done unless people know how to proceed with a project. If they're just sort of crippled, um, then, then they're not going to take any action. So um, being really educational and informative about what they need in order to get a project off the ground um, and in a way that helps them make informed decisions is actually really important to us getting work. 
Um, it's also just part of our, our mission, so there's no real, real conflict there. Um, but I do find it su surprising that it would be the case elsewhere because, because again, the, you know, the, word, the, the more people know, the more likely they are to take action to, to do preservation work. I think that's that's very true, and I think um, I'm also I think we're almost like outliers in the sense that we do work for companies or organizations that are supporting other companies, um, but at Artifactual, Artifactual sort of exists to support uh, Archivematica and support Access to Memory, which is uh, the different other software project that I work on, Archival Finding Aid um, platform, and. Um, in a lot of ways, uh, the, the ethos behind Artifactual is that you do want to sort of write your way out of the job. That's a lot of developers' goals, is to write your way out of a job, and then you can move on to a better job, more interesting job. Uh, and I think with, with Archivematica, uh, one of the service offerings that are Artifactual is like a support contract for a year, which is common for other um, vendors as well. Um, and sometimes we get people, it's an open source software, so you don't need to have support. You could run the software on your own just fine. A lot of people sort of buy the support for a year, not a lot, but some buy the support for a year and they don't plan on continuing. They wanna just be able to get set up the right way and be confident about their ability to run the project on their own, but they don't wanna admit that uh, so, but it, 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 I've like coaxed people into, I was like, I honestly, I mean, I'm not in charge of the budget, so I honestly don't care, but also I think as a company, we do like, we do enjoy that, but we would rather be spending money working on feature development or writing code or doing things rather than doing support. We'd rather have people be autonomous. So it is to educate people as much as we can while they have us for a year, I think has really been a goal of mine. I have two clients that are in that situation right now, I think. Um, and sometimes people also do continue because they, they get a lot of, um, a lot out of that support. Um, but it, we try to emphasize that we're not here to trap you into something. You can leave at any time. I think the open source ethos is, is so key to the work I do, and I don't think I could work in, in any other way. Um, yeah, we don't have any salespeople. We only have archivists, so <laughs> not great at sales either. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll add one small thing to that. I mean, so all, all of that being said, I still um, feel often that that like even from our clients that there's just a lot of like blind faith in what I'm going to do for them and that alone makes me uncomfortable. I'm like, no, it, like interrogate me. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you exactly how we're gonna do this. Um, because I, I know what that means um, for them. I know what it means for their collection, but it also means that, um, you know, potentially that's the kind of relationship that they have to service providers in general. Um, and I, def I definitely see that. And sometimes I have to be the one to say, have, you know, have you, have you thought about what you're going to do with these files when you get them back? Do you have a plan? You know? Yeah, it's almost supporting them to get out of this uh, Stockholm syndrome that they developed from other vendors. Yeah, you know, yes. It's okay to talk to me honestly because right. I'd rather help you now. Right. Um, and yeah, I find that the, the clients that are in that sort of situation where they want to become autonomous is the most rewarding work for me too because I get the most out of it because they're asking really difficult, interesting mm -hmm. questions um, rather than being like, something's broken, fix this. Right. Is there a way, do you think, that we can encourage other vendors um, to think a bit more interactively about the archival life of their products? Um, whether or not we can encourage them to be educators, more like you guys are. Um, is there a greater potential for them to engage in, in planning with preservation organizations, do you think, um, that could include greater dialogue and training in archival communities, within archival communities? You can interrogate your vendor. They're there to serve you, so. <laughs> I was um, struck by Avanthea's talk last year um, about interviewing visual effects agencies um, to find out about their practices, um, studying and encouraging them to think about project legacies, so to speak, um, and whether the, um, they could adopt more archival um, standards within their work practices. Um, so I was kind of interested if that's something that maybe as a community we could all come together and encourage vendors to do a bit more often, um, what kind of approaches we might be able to make towards them for that. I think some of the, the kind of like mass audiovisual digitization vendors um, obviously have so much knowledge about the work and whether or not they choose to share it, I guess is ultimately up to them. I, having served as a vendor and as a client in a mass digitization uh, situation, I, 
feel like I have some sympathy for the challenges that they're also facing um, because I think in this work, everyone feels squeezed and everyone feels undervalued and um, struggling for enough uh, financial support to do the work. So, you know, it's, it's hard when you're charging not very much for a tape when that tape could be very problematic to get transferred. And there might be a lot of hidden work that they're doing in just getting you some sort of result. And I think it's very easy to be on the client side with no awareness whatsoever of all of that challenge and just critique, you know, small mistakes here or there. So I think whether or not they're responsible for sharing what they've learned along the way, I guess is, is an open question to me, but I would encourage us all to be a little bit more sympathetic towards people who work in any of this, uh, in any type of zone. I wonder, Joanne, are you speaking of, of uh, vendors that are not archival specific? Yeah, potentially as well, yes. Because I mean, a lot of the workflows at MACE were dictated by kind of um, production workflows. And yeah. a lot of the material that's given to us has come through production workflows, so yeah, I would say. I feel like I've been lucky to work under Dave and Jerome, who are just like, well, we'll make our own. <laughs> so I don't know if I have that much to add. I know there's been some advocacy um, begging Black Magic for the importance of uh, keeping an open uh, software development kit, which has been crucial to creating software that is more targeted towards archivists. Um, but I don't know in detail uh, how that's going, other than tweeting at them and maybe approaching them in a vendor booth. Um, I mean, I think just transparency can go a long way in this effort. Um, like, you don't have to necessarily give every client, like, a video tour of your place and show them exactly how you did everything, but, um, um, but, you, can, but you can be transparent about the methods that you're using um, because that's a preservation-oriented effort in and of itself. You, what, ha what, what was done to your materials is, will inform future preservation decisions. Um, and, and, and that can be you know, educational in and, of it, in and of itself also, just, to, um, just to, to be transparent about the documentation that you do have about your, your workflows and things like that. I think for Archive Medica, I set up a GitHub repository that was the Archive Medica dash case dash studies, um, which I collected anytime anyone has talked about that workflow. Um, and I do try to encourage people to do that. I understand that's a lot of work to document it and release publicly, and sometimes you have to get permissions. Um, but I find that then me having that resource to share out when people are interested and wanting to know more is sort of helpful in um, pushing others to also be open and transparent. I think that's a great point, Bryce. And also removal of fees for that knowledge as well. Because um, in a perfect world, um, there'd be a great opportunity for education for beginners like myself. Um, something you said, Ashley, has made me think. Um, what happens when a, um, you create opportunities for education, but those opportunities aren't taken up, or there's sort of like a, um, like a resistance, um, a general interest to follow through, but, but for some reason you don't get bums on seats, perhaps. Um, how do you deal with that kind of issue? I feel like I'll ask somebody, I'll ask in general, then I'll ask someone specifically, and then I'll wait, and then I'll ask someone specifically again. <laughs> so it's a lot of nudging and being like, you can do this, you, we can set up a call if you want to go through this together, um, whatever it takes to sort of get someone um, over that, that initial barrier of being afraid, which is like, I have to applaud you, Joanna, you, you don't have it, you managed to just dive right in and it's amazing and I wish more people were like you to be able to just jump right in, but I do understand it, it can be quite intimidating or quite scary to make that first jump. No, no, no I just, I nag people, honestly. <laughs> do you think imposter syndrome might be a problem? I know it's, I hear it an awful lot amongst um, archivists, people believing that they have imposter syndrome, feeling like they don't know enough about their subject matter, is that? Yeah, yeah. Certainly, yeah. Yeah, I, I think so. I think, well, I think, I feel like the imposter syndrome oftentimes is, well, not justified. It's not like they are, but rather, I mean, the, the risk of being bullied in some internet spaces is quite high. <laughs> so I understand why people would be afraid to reach out. So trying to foster an environment where they don't feel that way um, is, yeah, what, what is the best, I think, 
that we can do. I don't know if other people have other ideas. I mean, I think, I think doing this work, we all feel totally ill-equipped from time to time, you know? I mean, it's, I just think it goes with the territory. And yeah, again, to echo Ashley, I think just trying to, en to encourage others to put out there the problems that they're facing, like that, that's something that I've always really struggled with is just not even vocalizing problems, but just putting myself out there enough and just saying this is what I'm thinking about with this work or this is what problems I'm facing. I think I've just gotten a lot out of seeing others like live so out loud in that way with everything that they're doing, whether it's you know educational stuff or blog posts, things of that nature. And so I think the more that we can all do that, the more we all benefit from it. Yeah, do you think talking about ways in which you have failed? Um, Julia Kim, for example, has, has really started like an initiative uh, where that's a conference talk topic, <laughs> and others as well, but Julia happens to be at this conference right now. Um, so I, I often try, and when I am teaching one-on-one, -on -one, um, like people will be like visibly very frustrated and I'm able to sort of say, like, I didn't know this either at the time. Like, it took me a long time to understand this. Or maybe I give examples in which. And so I think personally being vulnerable helps other people feel less scared and, and less vulnerable to be able to admit that that's also the same for me. I agree completely. I think um, if, I don't know, the people in this field who I admire and who, who I um, uh, count on for, um, for resources to, to have them share something they don't know or to even ask a question. I find great, com great comfort in that. Um, but also in, in my role, my favorite questions are like when I get a phone call from somebody and they're like, hey, so I found this tape. Um, you know, it's like small historical society and they're like, I found this tape and it's bigger than a VHS and it's smaller than a bread box. What is it? And like, <laughs> it's like, okay, we're starting here. I love you. Thank you. You're not afraid to ask. Um, and that actually makes my job so much easier instead of somebody taking a really long time to put together an inventory for a bunch of formats we don't work on. <laughs> um, so uh, I agree, making yourself vulnerable and, and encouraging that in others goes a long way. I'd also say from the, from the educator perspective, if students are struggling with the resources that you're putting out there, it could be a failure in the design of the yeah. resources. And yeah. so this is something, I co-teach with uh, Kelly Hayden, who I also worked with at the Bay Area Video Coalition, video preservation, and we've also done some uh, workshops and such. And we will get into these endless debates about how deep and how technical the, the information should be, and I always, I always have operated under the assumption that I want to provide educational resources that were not there for me when I was struggling through some of these things, so I want it to be as technical as I can possibly make it, but that may not actually be in the best interest of the students, and so I'm trying to think of new ways and maybe just study educational methods more broadly so that I can try to convey that information in a more digestible way. And just recently, I taught a workshop with another coworker, Nick Krabenhoft, um, and he was very insistent that the Python for AV class that we were teaching be taught in the library carpentry method, and he sent me some great videos. I don't remember where they are, but it was the guy who started library carpentry, and he recommended this book whose name escapes me, but it's in my Amazon shopping cart, just all about education, like how to teach people. And this was something that I will find and tweet about afterwards, but I think that's something that we could all work on. Was that the teach the process, not the tool? Was that the meme that was running amongst you all the time? I think that's really valuable. Myself, um, having done the blogs I've done, um, they are about the steps that I've taken to implement certain open source tools um, in a way that I, it's the only way I can express it, to be honest, because I don't know the tools that well yet. But it's, it's easier for me, I think, to map my own needs against other people's experiences and workflows um, than it is to just sit down and look at a standards website and, and sort of to, to get anything from it. So I think it's so important to, I think, give and then teach when you're at that level of having just learned something. And I think that's when people are most afraid to talk about what they know, because they know, they know enough it's the, uh, like Dunning-Kruger or whatever. They know enough to know that they don't 
really know anything, but they know enough to get other people started. It's the inter intermediary um, ramp up that we were talking about earlier. And I think it, it's, it's so important to teach at that level. And I think that as soon as you know a little bit more, you should know just only a little bit more <laughs> than the people you are teaching. Yeah. Um, and sometimes when you are like really an expert on something, it, you're not a good teacher. You're right, like, I mean, you are a good teacher <laughs> and an expert. But uh, I do think it, it can be difficult because there's such a gap in between like what you assume to be easy because it was so long ago when, right. when, when you found that out. Yeah, you took that for granted. I think you can also um, empower people to use, to like, start by using the tools and the skills that they do have. It's like, I think, I find myself working with archivists who are, again, maybe know nothing about AV, and that makes them really nervous. And it's like, well, you're still an archivist. Like, think about what you do with your paper formats. There are some similarities here. Like, you can apply some of the same thinking and encourage people to utilize the skills and the training that they do have and make them feel like, all right, this isn't such a stretch to learn something new. Um, and, and use the skills that I have. I'm like, can you make an inventory? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, that's really important <laughs> for the preservation of your audiovisual formats. You can do that. Um, so, so I find that I find that helpful for in, for encouraging people also. Yeah, I think meeting people where they're at and having just a lot of empathy for um, where they are at at that time and context is just crucial to being able to just be a good teacher. Yeah, and don't be frightened to make a fool of yourself as I regularly do on Twitter. <laughs> Just go for it. <laughs> um, I'm just mindful of the time. It's, it's like seven minutes to, and there's a gentleman there who's had his hand up for some time. Um, do we have a microphone? Is it this one? Uh, this oh. one yeah. So I'd like to open up to any questions. Thank you very much. Finally, it was time to give the voice to the public. Better later than never. Uh, so uh, this is uh, in between uh, a comment and question. Uh, uh, I have an impression with uh, every day that pass in such conference that uh, uh, audiovisual archivist is uh, some uh, self enough closed community that doesn't know what's happening outside them. And for that reason, consider many problems unresolved or try to resolve problems, but they are on forces. Uh, when I escape it from this closed uh, domain, uh, and uh, keep an eye on a, a recent scientific um, approach, a little scientific achievement. I observed that uh, science outside have already a solution for the, um, all of our problems. Uh, just we need to escape from our self enough and to keep an eye what's happening in photonic, quantum optic, bioimaging, uh, chemistry, and some similar. I, I was in many congress of uh, scientific congress, and when I asked the big scientists about our big problems, they say, well, it's a long time resolved. What is your problem? So just need, you, you just need to explain. So for my opinion, a uh, current archivist should escape from that idea and be, uh, how to say, multidisciplinary scientist, real scientist. And then you will see how the progress of the um, digitization, restoration, and uh, socialization, which is the third component we haven't discussed it, but it's very important also. Uh, see, we will speed up very quickly, but f as for now, I practically don't know somebody that is not, that is, uh, let's say, poly, multidisciplinary archivist. Everybody is. Uh, close it in, uh, in uh, the circuit and consider like, wow, 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 what, we, what big problems we have, what unresolvable problems we have, but they are resolvable because uh, real big uh, serious science resolve problems much, 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 much more complicated than our small problems. So I wanted to have an opinion. Uh, whenever I do the, my presentation, I... Uh, uh, finish them with uh, more science in our domain. Uh, just shortly, I make a presentation uh, picking up the jazz singers. You may know who, what is that, the first sound film, uh, which then with the current tools uh, that is come from the big science, we can do it uh, holographic in immersive sound. It's another story I if we I, need I think to I do can that. Comment on some of the things yeah. you've said. Um, I actually work really closely with scientists, physicists who are very much outside of the archival profession. Um, and I find their thinking to be 
um, very different. There's a very, very different approach to the work they, that they do in a way that um, can be inspiring at times, like you said, but um, I think it's similar in that I'm, I'm still kind of, um, well, so context, I, I work also with an experimental piece of technology, um, an optical scanning technology used to digitize broken and damaged grooved audio formats. Um, and it's um, very much in development still. We're, we're um, problem solving every day. It's, um, we work very closely with the scientists who developed it who are particle physicists. They are not archivists. This was a side project. Um, and um, they definitely don't have all the solutions. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, they've come up with some really amazing solutions, but it's, it is very much a collaborative effort between us to make the work preservation-oriented um, and documented and, and shareable and, and understandable. Um, I think this conference is such a like wonderful testament to being able to do a multidisciplinary um, event, and I just think that there should be more no time to waits in the world um, where we really are connecting archivists with developers, with standards authors, uh, with uh, other technologists and other realms. And I, I do think that archivists do need to do more in terms of bridging that gap with other people, some archivists. But I think that, that, that that's, that's the ethos of this entire conference. Yeah. That's ex exactly what I was going to say. Um, I mean, for me, one of the best parts of this conference is getting to share a table with people like Steve and Carl and actually just learn from them, but also hear them bring a different perspective to AV archiving and the things that we fixate on. And yeah, I'd say, right. yeah. That art, so art, Artifactual, my company, we're 29 people, and then I think a, th a third of us are archivists, a third of us are systems administrators, and a third of us are developers. And so I think that we just, uh, we're constantly working in an interdisciplinary fashion. We have a question from the live stream. Um, so this is from uh, Samaya Langley, and she's really asking about invisible labor that um, folks uh, do. So uh, how much volunteer work do you each do, including the tasks that you need to do for your job but you're not paid for? Um, and how much time do you spend dedicating uh, trying to learn some new things like that, that are outside of your like, given tasks to improve work for later? I'd say at Artifactual this year, I can't really fully speak on this, um, but my, my boss, Kelly Stewart, could. Uh, I think we've really been uh, working towards how do we talk about and emphasize, because we are a company that's purely based on supporting open source projects, two of them, and as I think a lot of people know in this room, that's quite difficult work. It's a lot of invisible labor and a lot of time and care. Um, and so one, we're working at trying to get better at engaging the community and reviewing pull requests and getting community contributions, but at the same time acknowledging that it takes a lot of time and labor, and that's money that is often unfunded. And so our our factual sort of has to fund itself. Like a lot of the, when you buy an hour of you know, service at Artifactual, half of that hour is just going into like free labor to support the product itself. And we're sort of thinking about um, better ways to do that. But I, I feel like I'm ill-equipped to actually speak on how we're doing that yet. Like suffice to, to say, it's more than zero, right? That you spend uh, more yeah. time than zero. I would say about half of my time is, is, is like, that I get paid for because I work there, but like is, is considered like non-billable work. Um, just wanted to mention it's five o'clock, but if, there's more. Well, I would just add that for the three days I was employed at MACE, I think probably one to two, one and a half to two days during my, my um, workflow um, period was definitely spent working privately in my home environment working on these things and learning Python as well. Um, but unfortunately I had to take a second job for six months last this year um, and the Python just had to stop because I couldn't do it in my spare time. So yeah, I definitely would say that there's an awful lot of background work that goes on for me anyway as a part-timer. I think that might be all the time we have um, before dinner starts, but we can surely continue this conversation over dinner, and I hope we will. Um, I'm just going to hand it off to Zhuzha to make a couple announcements before we break. <laughs>